Good morning. Um, on behalf of NSIDE and the University of Nebraska and the George Washington University's program on extremism, I'd like to welcome you to GW's campus. Uh, I'm glad to see everybody in person again. It's been a few, a number of online events since I have an offline event every once in a while to see each other's faces. We have an important conversation here. Um, if you look at the threat landscape in the US, uh, and I've been doing this for 20 years, not the 30 that Nick has, but at least 20 years, it is more fractured, more dynamic, and more complex than it's ever been. And what do I mean by that? Uh, the FBI talks about some thousand active investigations in all 50 states when it comes to ISIS and Al-Qaeda and um, individuals inspired by that. We had a recent attack on a number of NYPD officers uh, on New Year's Eve. Uh, and then we, have, we still have a number of other threats, right? We have domestic terrorism, which is at the forefront of, of both my mind, but also policymakers in Washington. The FBI director talked about some 850 active investigations in all 50 states three years ago when he testified in Congress uh, last week. It was 2,700. So we've developed kind of a three-time uh, rise in the number of active investigations. In fact, during the, the course of the year, they get about 9,000 cases uh, that they're clearing out and going through. We also have a very interesting dynamic when it comes to mixed ideologies. Individuals that don't fit in the buckets that they used to fit into. They're not just ISIS. They're not just incels. They're not just white supremacists. Sometimes they're a mixture of all of them in between, which makes law enforcement and intelligence officers' jobs a lot harder when we deal with this. So, with that in mind, uh, we try our best to program with, and with Insight to every six months to nine months bring in uh, top officials from the administration to say, well, where are we at in the threat? How do you see it? I get a sense of what I see it sitting so on the outside, but I imagine your view on the inside is much different than mine. Uh, six months ago, we hosted uh, Nick's predecessor, John Cohen, for a talk on the threat landscape. Uh, and today, I'm happy to welcome Nick Rasmussen uh, to talk to that. So Nick is, uh, has a very distinguished career. I will not go through all of it, um, but suffice to say, there are very few people in government that have been in government so long uh, on, on the categorization process prior to 9-11. So he saw that uh, on the front end, the back end, and was in the mix of it at all, and has seen the threat evolve throughout. Had a storied career at the White House and National Security Council, uh, was the director of the National Counterterrorism Center. In fact, he was my boss's 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 boss when I was there. So I'm looking forward to asking you the questions whether you've ever read that memo I sent. Um, <laughs> spent a little bit of time at, at the Global Internet uh, Forum for Counterterrorism, working uh, with civil society and tech companies on ways to counter some of the things we're seeing online. And like a good public servant, was called back into it. And sometimes, most of us can try to re resist that and do a good job of it. Um, Nick did not have the strength to be able to say no when the president asked you to serve. So uh, it is a great honor to have Nick here. The run of the show is um, uh, uh, Nick will give a 10, 15 minute uh, opening of what, where DHS, Department of Homeland Security, sees the nature of the threat. Then we'll uh, move over to um, question and answers. My colleague, Erin uh, Grace, is here. She's the Director of Strategic Communications for Insight at the University of Nebraska. Uh, a, a lovely, prior, her prior career was a lovely uh, columnist for the World Herald at Omaha, uh, and is now uh, helping run and shape um, that or, uh, organization, Insight. Uh, unfortunately, Gina Lincoln wasn't able to join us today. I know she wanted to be here, but she was feeling a little bit under the weather, um, and given the nature of where we are in life, I think it's probably best that people stay home. Um, so we'll do that, we'll end up with questions and answers, and we'll open up to the floor for, for any questions that people may have on this. Uh, we are not live streaming, but the video will be posted on our YouTube page as soon as this is done, just uh, the internet being what it is, and then we'll go from there. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the graduates. So, um, said yes to Seamus when he offered the invite on the condition that I not have to give a speech speech. And I really wanted a speech, was, and then when he pitched it as a, a conversation with um, two distinguished experts in their own right, that made a lot more sense to me than getting up here and, and talking at you for 35 or 40 minutes. But what I thought I would do was say a few things about three broad topics, and the reason there are three broad topics is I just always tend to think in threes. And these are kind of three buckets of issues that are very much on my mind these days. Um, and then we're, of course, looking forward to opening up to the full conversation. Those three buckets. Threat landscape, some of which Seamus gave you a good preview on. Um, second bucket related to the first, 
where CT counterterrorism fits, falls, or doesn't within the current um, broader national security landscape that we live in, because that's a that's a moving, evolving picture, something that has certainly changed over the course of the post 9-11 period. And then the third and last chunk of things I'd like to talk about, a bucket of things I'd like to talk about briefly, is the challenges associated with the work that we do at DHS tied to prevention, preventing violent extremism. Um, and by that I mean our efforts to prevent individuals from pursuing a path that ultimately leads them to a place where they engage in a violent act and be classified as terrorism. So those three broad buckets, and as Seamus said, just in 10, 15 minutes, no more than that. Threat line, um, or threat landscape rather, my tagline here is one that Seamus used a slight variation. Um, and I think it's one I could have used at pretty much any time I testified over the course of my government career. The threat environment our national security and homeland security professionals are dealing with is more diverse, more dynamic, and more complicated than any other point previously. And I, I think that is almost a truism at this point that it's on a, it measured on that axis, complicated, dynamic, um, diverse, it's a, it's a nearly constant upward trajectory. Doesn't mean there aren't successful things that we have done to mitigate pieces of that threat. Doesn't mean that some things we worry about are less worrisome now than they were some years ago. But aggregated, on the whole, the, the picture seems to grow more complicated, more dynamic, and more diverse every year. And I'll start with the overseas environment with that first. And the good news there, and I, again, I don't need to tell this audience that, is that we have achieved what I would call suppressive effect on the ability of groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda to carry out large-scale attacks here in the homeland. That is not nothing. That is something pretty significant and came at great cost measured across all different metrics. But it is suppressive effect that makes it far more difficult, and I would argue, I don't want to say the word impossible, but almost inconceivable that an overseas terrorist group could mount the kind of attack that we experienced at the time of 9-11. The threat landscape has less good news in it, though, in that there seems to be no significant diminishment of the pool of violent extremists or terrorists who are ideologically driven to want to carry out violence against the United States or our partners or allies overseas. When you pair those two things together, suppressive effect and that pool of operatives, I don't even use the word operatives, pool of ideologically driven individuals, I worry that the suppressive effect that we have achieved at great cost is not permanent, or there's certainly nothing about that condition that would suggest that it will be permanent naturally or on its own. Threat landscape here at home, again, Seamus kind of beat me to the punch. Um, I don't need to tell this audience how the domestic violent extremist phenomenon has grown. The DVE phenomenon has grown in size, diversity, and lethality in recent years. And Seamus, again, used one of the metrics I often use because I think it's, it's the best way to capture what our investigative law enforcement and intelligence capacity domestically is focused on. And it's the, the words of the FBI director when he gets up in front of the Congress and talks about the level of effort that the FBI is putting into this set of issues. And again, if we've done this a few years ago, we would have been talking about rough parity in the, in the level of effort FBI was, was devoting to the domestic terrorism set of challenges as opposed to the international terrorism set of challenges. But again, measured in the, in the FBI director's words, that balance has begun to tilt. Um, and whether it's racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism, or anti-government and, and anti-establishment violent extremism, different flavors of extremism, um, the, my key takeaway point is that the diversity of different extremist thought streams, ideologies, narratives um, gripping various segments of our population here in the United States is at an all-time high. I'm leaving tomorrow afternoon for a trip to the West Coast with some of my DHS colleagues, and the purpose of the trip is community engagement. We're working with, meeting with, a number of different communities. The one thing those communities all have in common is that they are targeted. They are, have the, themselves been the victims of targeted violence, uh, either recently or in the recent past, and they they are obviously on edge. They want to know what their government can do to help them. They want to know when are we going to do more to get a grip on this problem. Um, and yes, I'm going to the Los Angeles area, but you could make the same argument if we were talking about nearly any metropolitan area, nearly any area in the country right now. Urban, suburban, or rural, there is some form of 
domestic violent extremism at play in that environment and creating a challenge for the, for the federal government as it tries to achieve reach and impact across the country. And that's very much different from the period in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, or even most of our post-9-11 history, where yes, we were worried about the HVE phenomenon, the homegrown violent extremist phenomenon, but even that was much more of a, what I would say, an urban or suburban problem and less of a rural or across the country problem. You could target your resources in ways around the country that you could achieve more effect than we're able to at this point. So that's the threat landscape in a very, very quick snapshot. Second bucket of issues I wanted to quickly touch on was where does CT, counterterrorism, fit into this conversation about national security at this point in time? Because again, that is a moving picture. There's no question that great power competition, GPC in the acronym that government seems to have developed just in the last few years, um, GPC rightly sits at the top of our national security priority list or framework at present. For this administration, or I would argue for any administration, I don't think there's really much difference between administrations in terms of the level of priority they would be attaching to work on Russia, China, etc. The, the logical consequence of that is that there is less time, energy, and resource being devoted to meeting our CP challenges. I present this not as a value judgment, not as a criticism, not as a critique, simply as a reality. Outstanding director of the National Counterterrorism Center, Christy Abizade, my friend and my successor in the role, has a tougher job than I, I did. Because of the, the threat landscape that I described is as, as difficult or more complicated than it was when I was in her, her role. And she's doing it having to meet that challenge with much more of a strain on her resources and much, and much less ability to command the attention of the broad government interagency community the way we so often did in the post-9-11 period. A strategy going forward in that environment where you have a complicated threat landscape with less time, energy, and resource to meet that, that threat landscape, a strategy going forward will, will necessarily involve risk mitigation and risk management rather than being able to overwhelm all of the different threats that we face with our own capabilities. Um, it's no secret that for much of the post-9-11 period, we dealt with our threat concerns overseas with aggressive forward deployed direct action capabilities. There's less of that available to us now. There's less interest in carrying out that kind of activity now. We certainly have learned the costs associated with carrying out that aggressive counterterrorism work overseas, even as we understood the benefits that it might have garnered for us in terms of keeping us safe. And so that risk management approach that I, that I, that I kind of see as, a, as the nature of counterterrorism work right now um, relies on a couple of pillars or building blocks that are, that are, I would argue, particularly challenging. First, there's an intelligence challenge. How do we gain the necessary IMW, indicators and warning, indications and warning, to give you a sense that conflict zone A located on continent B overseas is about to become the, the breeding ground for a form for a particular terrorist group that holds the ambition to target the United States? or our interests. How do you ga gather and process and analyze that intelligence in an environment where you are less present, less forward deployed, less well resourced? Secondly, a strategy to deal with, with this surge in great power competition focus at the, uh, and, and lesser emphasis on counterterrorism, by definition means that we are relying on capacity building efforts with overseas partners, things we would have probably chosen to do directly before, we will now look to partners to do on our behalf or in partnership with us now. And third, this strategy also relies, that we, or also calls on us to rely on our last line of defense here at the border. And this is where my work in the Department of Homeland Security comes into play. Ultimately, our best protection against attack from external adversaries is our screening and vetting apparatus that ideally identifies individuals who are trying to travel to the United States who might potentially have a nexus to terrorism and denies them the ability to enter the United States. That, as you can, as you can imagine, is a complex data-intensive exercise and one that is, um, in many ways, a zero-fail mission. And yet, that, that particular line of business vetting and screening at our borders to make sure that we are um, 
understanding of those who are entering our borders becomes even more important in this environment where we are not engaged in the direct action of business overseas as we once were. So all of this leaves us in a place where we have less margin for error. And again, I present this not as value judgment, not as criticism, not as critique. It is natural and understandable that our resources are flowing towards meeting the challenges of great power competition. And in many reasons, and in many cases, in many respects, you could argue that it's been our success at preventing homeland attacks that has allowed us to make the choices that we are making. But it's just a simple truth that we are managing risk in a complicated threat landscape with fewer tools and less margin for error. And that's just something to keep in mind. Third and lastly, the set of prevention issues. Um, I'll start by saying there I am not an expert, I am, but I've been part of the conversation on prevention issues for most of the last 15 to 20 years, as Seamus alluded. And I think we've learned a lot collectively as a government, as a community, about what not to do in this space. And those were hard-learned lessons. And they were lessons learned not by ill will or malice, but just by performance or approaches or strategies that did not prove as fruitful or productive as we wanted. We learned a lot about what not to do, as I said. We've learned not to try to overly securitize our prevention efforts or to use the, the rubric of national security or intelligence or law enforcement to put a frame around these conversations with communities around the countries. Don't give this, we've learned not to give this work an intelligence flavor or a law enforcement flavor. Why? Because it sets the community that you're working with on edge. It creates exactly the kind of us versus them relationship that we cannot afford to have if we're going to be successful in prevention work. Also on the don't do list is don't, approve, don't approach vulnerable communities as if they are the problem. Don't approach these communities as if you're only interested in talking to them in hopes that they will help identify bad actors within their communities. Seems simple, seems true, or seems like a truism, but that's often how our prevention approaches were perceived. And I can state with certainty, they were never intended to be perceived that way, but that was the perception that many of our communities around the country have. So with those lessons learned, we've worked very hard to adapt our prevention approaches in, in more recent years. Um, the idea is to approach communities in the spirit of partnership, offering expertise and resources and support, rather than treating it, again, as I said, as a law enforcement investigative exercise. The goal is to try to focus on risk factors that that community might be aware of that might make certain individuals vulnerable to potential radicalization, and to, make the, and to offer the community help in developing protective factors that might prevent that individual from proceeding down that path. It sounds obvious and self-evident, but we didn't arrive at this but through long and hard experience. The phrase you hear more and more often from my prevention colleagues around the government is that we are taking a more public health-minded approach to the issue of prevention, identifying risk factors, identifying resources that would, that would lower those risk factors or offer countervailing protective factors to help a community. That approach makes sense to me as a matter of logic. I'm hoping it, it helps break down barriers of communication that we've had with certain communities across the country. So I'm hopeful that, that, that we're headed in the right direction with our prevention work. Last thing I'll say in wrapping up though is that the prevention work that we are doing, the biggest challenge we face is scale. How do we scale this to the size of the problem that Seamus spoke to and that I spoke to? Um, the, whether it's the, the size of budgets um, um, to support grant work in this space, or the number of professionals that we have with expertise, talent, and, and experience working on these issues, we are at a deficit. We do not have sufficient coverage, I would argue, with our prevention efforts across the country, and that will be a struggle going forward. So I think if if over the next few years we can do anything, if I had one wish on my wish list, it would be if we could put ourselves on a pathway towards scaling our prevention efforts to meet the demand signal that is so obviously there. Seamus, I'll stop there and join you guys over at the chairs. Thank you for your remarks. That's around with the noise. We'll be good.
Um, thank you for your remarks. It was um, very interesting on it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the front end of your remarks. Um, because I was struck by this idea that there hasn't been a, in your words, no significant diminishment of the threat. And so overseas threats, plotting, and things like that, there's been some successes. We can debate the finer points of, of why and whether that was too far or too little. But in the homeland, no significant diminishment. What do you test that to? Like why? So I, I was trying to be precise in my words, and my no significant diminishment language was attached to the pool of individuals around the world who still subscribe to an ideology that would have them want to wish us ill or carry out action against us. I would not make the argument that we face the same degree of threat here in the homeland from, for direct attack from those individuals, from groups, FTOs, foreign terrorist organizations, um, operating abroad. But I worry that we, as we let the, as if we allow the suppressive effect that, against those groups that we have achieved to deteriorate over time, that we could see a resurgence. And I know that is, that is what our intelligence community spends a lot of time thinking about right now. What are the things we need to be watching for that would give us the kind of warning that we are seeing a group that is locally focused today but beginning to have global ambition? Um, and the concern is that we will not have the, the resource picture in place to allow us to see that. Um, so I guess that's where I would what, maybe slightly correct your characterization of what I said. Yeah. We're, I think we're going to turn off the mics and go with the handheld just for the feedback. We're going to adapt with the threat environment, right? Uh, I have one more question, then Aaron may want to jump in on this. There, there's been a lot of talk, the White House had a, a summit on United Against Hate. Um, you know, our colleagues at ADL put out a report last week said that um, there's been a unprecedented record number of anti-Semitic incidents in this country. I understand that there's a task force on anti-Semitism or counting anti-Semitism. In many ways, when you look at an issue like anti-Semitism, it's cross-cutting. And by that I mean it's the connective glue for all forms of extremism, whether it be far right or jihadists or single issue. Um, when you kind of unpack or peel back the onion, anti-Semitism is at its root. So I'm interested in seeing you know, if you see that the same way, and also what DHS is going to do about this, what, what, what your role is on a, any strategy that may or may not come out. Sure, sure. Um, and the phrase, again, I often use myself is hate-fueled extremism. It's, anti-Semitism is a quintessential example of hate-fueled extremism. The White House is involved right now leading an interagency effort to create an anti-Semitism strategy to begin to gather all of the appropriate resources that the government has to deal with the challenges that we're dealing with, that we're seeing tied to anti-Semitism. So it's going to sound pretty wonky and bureaucratic to say it, but it's an ongoing interagency process right now that we're like literally midstream in. So stand by, the White House will certainly have more to say when there are outcomes to be announced. But it is also important to note that the, the work in this area is meant to be the leading edge of a much broader effort to deal with Islamophobia and other forms of hate-based, hate-fueled extremism and violence around, around the country. And the tools and resources that are developed in the, in the process of creating this anti-Semitism strategy will of course be um, relevant to dealing with other forms of extremism. So stand by. In terms of what DHS will bring to the table in that, in that conversation, it's the stuff that DHS has both resources and statutory responsibility to do. The grant making programs that we have that support the prevention work I just talked about, the, the grant programs that support communities as they try to, I hate to say it, um, harden the target, um, create security measures and create security capabilities in community venues. Uh, for, or that are considered particularly vulnerable or that might be the target of hate-fueled extremism. There, is, there are lots of federal resources available to help support communities as they try to build that capability, and that's where DHS will most um, tangibly show up in these strategies. Thank you for coming, and thank you for having me here. We're happy to represent insight and support program on extremism's efforts. I want to talk to you about prevention since you brought it up. 
Um, DHS just rolled out a really good website, actually a resource that pulls in prevention efforts from 17 agencies. And so, two questions here. You know, what do you want to see? And what has been the response so far? But then, since because I come from Omaha and may represent how this would be rolled out locally, what should local communities, what should local actors do with this information? And how would you advise the federal government best get it out beyond the website? Thanks, Aaron, for the question. And it, I was involved in a rollout of this new website at the end of last week, and it's, it's called the PRF, the Prevention Resource Finder. And if you put that into your, your search engine, um, you will find a website uh, hosted that aggregates, as, as Aaron said, information about program, programmatic offerings from 17 different federal agencies or departments, all tied or linked to some form of prevention work. This is pretty basic blocking and tackling of government. What this should suggest to you is something we probably might have done a long time ago. Um, lots of different work streams and work strands across the government under different agencies, budgets, budgets and statutory frameworks, but not all of it packaged in a way where the public, where community organizations who might want to take advantage of these resources can readily or easily find that. How do we know this to be true? It's because whenever we have one of these horrific attacks here in the homeland, we invariably hear our, our frontline um, professionals who are engaging with those communities in the aftermath invariably hear when we talk about resources that could have been available to them, well, we didn't know about that. We didn't know that you had active shooter training that you could share with us so that our synagogue understood what we would do in an active, uh, active shooter scenario or our, our mosque, or our faith community, what we could have done that. Now we know, we'd love to tap into that. As you can imagine, that's heartbreaking if you're in the government to hear that a community comes out in the aftermath and says, well, we wish we'd known about these resources. This website will not solve that problem, but it will certainly aggregate the material and, the, and provide kind of a one-stop entry point shopping venue for a community that is engaged in self-help. We're looking to identify resources available at the government level. It's also designed to gain feedback. What isn't there that you need to be there? Or if you're a community and you're feeling at risk, what don't you see here that you feel you need from the government to help you keep your community safe? Thank you. Can I ask another one really quick? Thank you. Well, I have the mic. Well, I have the floor. <laughs> you're not getting it back, Seamus. That's right. Um, we can shut Seamus out at this point. It's a good run. I'm only a pretty face. So, so I do communications for Insight, and, and the government's way of communicating threats is a threat assessment bulletin that come up, comes out. And I noticed the latest one is set to expire in May, which is doesn't look like that right around the corner in Omaha. We had snow yesterday, but here it looks like May will be in a minute. Do you know, is there another threat bulletin that's coming out, given the upward trajectory? Has the pace or cadence of these bulletins slowed down? How do you get this to, how do you get yeah, a message that's a great to question. if you're issuing um, bulletins all the time? Do people tune them out? The NTAS system that Aaron's referring to, the National Threat Assessment System, is a tool. And a tool, it's a tool designed to increase public awareness around what the threat picture is at any given moment here in the United States. It's easy to use the NTAS system when, we, when we're facing some very acute piece of threat or threat activity that's tied to a specific intelligence or a specific date, or there's an event or something where we go, aha, we have to issue a bulletin so that everybody gets on their front foot and steps up their effort to protect against X. What's harder is when you're trying to describe in a useful way to communities and to the public, what is our steady state threat environment right now? So for example, you know, the NTAS bulletin that we last issued was in the period just before Christmas uh, and New Year's, I think roughly in late November, early December, it was very soon after I rejoined government at DHS. And it was important there, we were able to point to a number of the things that happened and didn't happen around the period of the election, because you certainly will remember there was concerns about going into the election period, the midterms, that we might see a spike in violence or certainly extremist activity tied to the midterm elections. And the, the good news story was that that was largely not the case. We, it was certainly spurred um, incidents of concern. So we took advantage of the NTAS bulletin to describe that environment to the public. Um, that's the value. What we worry about, we all, what we often have to 
ask ourselves is what are we doing to add to the knowledge of people? Are we doing it in a way that they're not just tuning out if we say roughly the same message at routine intervals? So I know we, as we sit down to have this discussion, Aaron, about whether to reissue or issue a, a new NTAS bulletin, the primary question driving this will be what more and new information do we have that will inform the public and give them a better chance of understanding the threat we face and protecting me against it. If that means just rewriting what we issued in December and trying to find a bunch of synonyms <laughs> so, it does, so that when people like reporters look at it and ask, this doesn't say anything new. That, that's not a useful exercise. But we, what we will ask of our intelligence professionals is, are there any changed dynamics in that threat environment that we've been talking about this morning that are worth lifting up and highlighting, particularly to the public? Because those NTAS bulletins are largely um, designed to inform the public. We have lots of other vehicles and means for doing intel production analysis and sharing with state and local law enforcement partners. Those NTAS bulletins are meant to tell Americans, those who live in America, what they need to, to know about the threat environment. And so if we don't have something new to tell them, then I would be reluctant to just, as a matter of habit, keep churning them out. I want to talk a little bit about um, what the FBI calls the salad bar effect, right? So these are individuals kind of pick and choose their own adventure ideologies. And I think back to my time in government, we had a desk for Al-Qaeda, we had a desk for Al-Shabaab, we had a desk of folks that covered Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. We were siloed in many ways. That You were an expert on Halaki, you were an expert on X, Y, and Z. When you talk about mixed ideologies, these are folks that are kind of going across different um, narratives and belief systems and things like that, and they're choosing the type of reason they're going to attack that day. I wonder whether, and you could have a uh, disagree with me on this, I wonder whether we're structured to address that changing threat, right? And where are we on, on this idea that everyone has to basically be an expert in all forms of extremism in order to spot extremism? Good question. Um, luckily, I don't run an intelligence organization right now where I have to kind of make those, <laughs> those block and line or chart decisions. But I know it's, it's very much on the minds of our senior leaders who, who drive the analytical work in this space. And it's because of exactly what you just said. We, you, there's still a place for that set of analysts who dig in deeply to a known FTO, foreign terrorist organization, who understand literally everything about the, the structure, the history, the functioning of that organization. And they could, in their brain, mentally give you the kind of the, the masthead of, of that for lack of a better word, that organization. But that knowledge better not, to your point, Seamus, remain silent because the extremism that that one group might be, um, the form of extremism that that one group might be um, engaged in, most likely in, has intermingled with other forms of extremism. And that's something that I think we've increasingly acknowledged to ourselves, is that we, we may not have the, the structures in place that would allow us to deal with that cross-pollinization. I'll give you another example. Um, even what we would highlight as our domestic violent extremist threat, DVE threat, we have to pay very close attention to what might be the transnational components of that threat. In most of the recent cases of an attack overseas, um, individuals who might have been driven by um, far-right ideology or white supremacist ideology, those individuals are very likely to have had linkages or certainly commingling of information with individuals here in the United States who, who hold and share the same views. So I'm gonna pull and in, vice versa. I'm going to pull in that a little bit to drive the conversation. So <laughs> let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the worldwide threat hearing last week and the Office of Director of National Intelligence along with the rest of the IC really kind of lean forward on this idea of transnational networks of racially motivated violent extremists. How transnational are they actually, are they learning from each other or there's actually money changing hands, training happening, things like that. When we say transnational, do we really mean transnational or do we just mean sharing of belief systems? I think, I wouldn't limit your definition of transnational to only involving some of the latter categories of of activity that you just described. If those 
if those individuals, and it's most often individuals and not necessarily organizations that are engaged in this exchange back and forth, in addition to kind of sharing ideas, ideology, grievance narratives, etc., they're also certainly capable of sharing tactics, techniques, suggestions, um, expertise, knowledge, etc. In the same way that we worried about Al Qaeda networks sharing knowledge about how to use explosives to gain maximum effect um, across organizational lines, I would worry about the ability of an individual located on the other side of the world to offer a suggestion to someone here in the United States or vice versa about how to do something. And that makes it, I wouldn't call it a transnational network in the same way that we thought about Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State as a transnational network. But it has transnational attributes. And, and more importantly, who cares what we call it? More importantly, it means that we've got to cooperate better with our foreign partners and making sure that we can exchange that kind of information with them so that they can take action against them, against those individuals, not as a matter of, of our interest, but a matter of their own self-interest. And that's a conversation that was not ongoing among our partners three, four, five years ago when I left government the first time. And now I can tell you with certainty there isn't a point, there isn't an exchange on extremism and terrorism among our, us and our foreign partners where these issues don't feature tied to domestic extremism. Sorry. So on that note, where are we at with the White House domestic terrorism strategy? What is next in implementing that? Again, my wonky bureaucratic answer there is it is being implemented. In fact, I, one of the projects I'm involved with at the Department of Homeland Security right now is literally tallying up all of the different programmatic activities that we were, I don't want to say assigned, but that we identified as responsive to the, um, the call of the domestic terrorism, counterterrorism strategy and making sure that we're delivering and following through on it. So if we said, we will do X and Y in terms of our prevention activities. Well, what are we doing? And if we're not doing it, what are the resource shortfalls that are preventing us from doing it? What are the programmatic um, or other changes we need to, to make to make sure that we are following through on that strategy? So I would say we're kind of in that, that below the waterline place, Aaron, where it's just government agencies now trying to follow through and carry out and, and deliver on the tasks they were assigned. Over time, we'll want some way to hold ourselves accountable in a way and say, okay, have, when you add all of that up, has it achieved the effect that the White House wanted, that we all wanted when that strategy was issued? I think it's too early to tell. Um, and I would argue that most terrorism, counterterrorism strategies that I've been involved with, anything less than a five or 10 year time horizon for evaluating your success is probably too short. Um, which is frustrating because of course most administrations naturally think in much shorter time horizons. But it's very difficult to, to develop counterterrorism related strategies that can deliver measurable progress in a one or two or three year time frame. We are gonna open up the questions then we have a hard stop at 11. Um, while people are thinking about their questions, please just raise your hand and we will um, bring over a, a mic. I have one question for you as people are percolating these type of things. Targeted violence, right? So this is kind of a term of art that came in during the Trump administration, has stuck with it for the Biden administration. The idea being, you have a set of individuals who just want to run the score, right? They want to kill as many people as, as humanly possible in the shortest amount of time and likely live stream that they could uh, and try to inspire others for it. How tough of a, of a problem set is that? I mean, what, what role would DHS play in something like that? Is it, is it more kind of hardening uh, soft targets? Is there something else that I'm not seeing when it comes to the role of DHS on targeted violence? Again, I think there the, the effort will be to come at it from both sides. Come at it from a purely protective and defensive posture, trying to give communities, as I said earlier, access to the resources, the training, the whatever they need to be able to engage in more protection, self-protection. At the same time, the Individuals who engage in that kind of targeted violence often have share many of the same common pathways that traditional, I don't want to say traditional, extremists of other varieties that we've been looking at for a long time share. And so 
ideally the same prevention resources that we are making communities aware of would help us identify individuals who, who fall at risk, who, who are at risk of becoming a perpetrator of this kind of targeted violence. And, and what's the purpose of identifying these individuals? Well, in most cases, the purpose is to try to identify uh, a redirect or an off-ramp or some form of pathway that involves them be, being disrupt, uh, disrupted is a word that often carries a connotation of counterterrorism or something he's disrupted. It involves their pathway being interrupted. And ideally, at the earliest possible point, and ideally at a point before it has entered the judicial system, and ideally at a point when it can be dealt with at the, the local level using locally based resources and not a federal government response. So, so in many ways, targeted violence may be a different flavor of this problem, but I think we're still going to be relying on the same toolkit. Again, trying to work the problem from both ends, from both the protective hardening of facilities, of training of individuals, but also identifying the actor and getting the actor off the path. Let's go with the question, not a diatribe. Huh? Question, okay. We don't have a problem. <laughs> Matt Greenfreak, um, I am offering a course here at GW on uh, women and terrorism. And so one of the biggest uh, complaints I hear from my students is there's not enough data on you know, gender disaggregated findings, right? So to what extent are women and other genders um, more at risk, uh, affected, perpetrating violence, right? Um, and so this is interesting, given this time, this administration has placed a great emphasis on gender equality, they've established the Gender Policy Council, there's a greater movement on women, peace, and security. So I'd be curious to hear a little bit about how DHS is really planning on ensuring that we're assessing the threat and then informing communities from that gender-inclusive perspective. It's a great question, and I'm not sure I have as detailed an answer as I want to have. I know we rely in part on our research partners at Nebraska in terms of helping us stay abreast of cutting edge research and the insights derived from that research that would help us target our programs more effectively. And if that means looking at the, the terrorism landscape we have through a more gender aware lens, then yes, we need to be doing that. I'm definitely aware of kind of some of this cutting edge work because in my last role in government before I came back to DHS, at the Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism, our academic network, GNET, often helped fund some of this research. And I, I spent some time just last fall at the University of Melbourne with some colleagues there who are doing some work in this space. So I know there is cutting edge research on which to draw. I just don't know what the kind of the so what of that research is in terms of it telling us do this differently or look here, not over there. And Aaron, you may be aware of any specific research I'm going at, at, at Insight right now, I'm going to put you on the spot on that, but it's just something I can't imagine hasn't come across in the guys landscape. Actually, I'll make a plug for an event we're doing, you can all register for it tomorrow, but we are researching the foreign uh, terrorist fighter problem here in the U.S. and bringing people back, and that is very gendered, and there is a gendered approach to that answer, and so that won't get at all of your question, but it'll get at some of your question, and let's be in touch after this, thank you. From a proactive standpoint, what are some of the, maybe, or a success and uh, a pain point or two around uh, interagency and interdepartmental collaboration and kind of the, the choices that you're making around how to invest resources proactively to build that collaborative network? That's a great question. Do you hate? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's um, I'll just give you a, a simple example. I'll be a little bit vague just because it, it strays into the, the classified world a little bit. But as you can imagine, um, our intelligence community continues to sit on vast, vast troves of information that were collected during all of the different overseas efforts of the last two decades. Not all of that information has fully been processed, assessed, and kind of put into the bloodstream of the broader intelligence community in the way that you would want it to be to ensure that your analysts have access to the full picture of everything we as a government know. Why? 
simple backlog, just things pile up. And when resources are redirected to meet higher priority concerns, or what are seen to be higher priority concerns, something like a backlog, instead of being this big, becomes this big. And of course, if you're in the terrorism space, you wonder, is that is the dot that would give us the insight that we need, if connected to another dot, is that dot resident in that pile of unprocessed, not yet fully exploited intelligence? It's a wonky answer, I've said that a couple times today, but it's a reality. And yet some of, some of the resources that, we're, that we've devoted to that project of reducing backlog and working through all of that, that treasure trove of material are naturally now focusing on other high priority problem sets. If we're going to be looking backward at information, we might just as be interested in looking backward at, for information on China and Russian behavior and exploiting material there that may be unexploited as well. So that's a pain point. And because yeah. as a result, the, the agencies and departments with direct CT responsibility bear a little bit more risk because of decisions made by other organizations to prioritize or deprioritize. It's all, this, again, I'll say it again, not a critique. It is just simply a, a matter of trying to, to balance competing priorities in a resource environment where you don't have enough to do everything you need and want to do. Thank you. Thanks for your remarks, Nick. Um, given your point about um, the kind of national threat landscape shifting more resources to great power competition, that has to affect the pipeline of young professionals interested in contributing to the CT problem set. So how is DHS including in its prevention efforts a way to ensure that young professionals who are diverse across a number of vectors, be that rural, suburban, urban, are contributing to solutions? It's a great question, and again, this, this too is another issue that often comes down to resources. Do you have the resources to bring into government the kind of expertise, talent, and diversity of experience and perspective that you want to meet these challenges? I would say there's an awareness of that. I don't know that we've achieved our objectives in this space yet. I have been encouraged that we are, in fact, and this hasn't always been true, as Seamus knows, in the course of our government experience. When we go through these periods where there are hiring freezes, whether that's one year, two year, three year, four years, it's like death being in government. Because all of a sudden, the pipeline stops. And even if it's only a couple of years, you feel that because there isn't that inflow of people, not just off of university campuses, but out of research organizations and across the, the, the professional landscape. It, it grinds to a halt for a period of a few years. Luckily, we're not in that place now, and we continue to see an inflow of talent and, and diverse perspectives into our workforce at DHS. Doesn't mean we're where we want to be, but, but I think we're not unhealthy in that regard. The other thing I would say about this, and this is something that differentiates the terrorism, counterterrorism effort from a few years ago, I would argue that now the, the community of people who are relevantly expert on this issue extends so far beyond government as to not be imagined. Um, and I'll be very blunt and honest here. I spent most of my career focused on overseas counterterrorism, and while I often read research pieces from scholars I, I admired or um, experts who I had high regard for, I was never in a position where I thought that they had more information than I had. Um, because our intelligence gave us such a clear picture, a much clearer picture than anyone outside government could possibly have had. That is not true, demonstrably not true, with the DVE problem set. There, isn't, there aren't too many weeks that go by where there isn't some study being released by some organization that adds deep, deep, insight into our collective shared understanding of the DVE problem. Last week it was the terrific report put out by the Anti-Defamation League. They're aggregating data that is really, really valuable to us in government. And I'm, I'm not citing ADL alone, there's certainly other organizations as well. So I think the, the surface area of professionals working on this problem set is much, much wider and more diverse because it's not limited to government only. And that wasn't always true, I would argue, 
8Q ISIS days. We have time for one more question, Jeff. Thanks very much for doing this. Really appreciate it. I'm going to try to stick three very quick questions. <laughs> First, um, you talked earlier about suppressive effect. I think in threes. <laughs> Me too sometimes. You talked earlier about suppressive effect, and of course there's been a lot of concern in Afghanistan. How much do you worry about the lack of a U.S. presence there and the lack of suppressive effect, given the ongoing threats from ISIS, Khorasan, and Al-Qaeda? Um, also, uh, to what extent do you see great powers, Russia, China, other medium powers, trying to leverage the domestic violent extremist landscape in the U.S. right now and, and going forward? And then finally, there's been ongoing concern. It's been a political hop on an issue. Uh, terrorists allegedly trying to cross the southern border or other borders. What is the, the state of play right now with terrorists trying to infiltrate the U.S., whether it's across Mexico or at other points of entry? Three easy ones. Um, <laughs> Afghanistan. I, I guess I had Afghanistan in mind very much when I described what I described when I was at the podium. That is a place where we are actively in a risk management and risk mitigation posture, trying to take the best advantage we possibly can of the, in, of the intelligence resources we have residual intelligence resources we have to have the best possible picture so that we can forecast if we if we are at risk of facing a renewed threat to the homeland from an ISIS-K or an Al-Qaeda. Um, it's a suboptimal posture. I don't think anyone would argue anything otherwise. But to me, it's one that uh, makes sense. It, 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 that was in a sense what was traded for when the decisions were made to end our active involvement on the ground in Afghanistan. So we knew we would be in, in this position. Our intelligence community now devotes a great deal of time and attention to trying to surround the problem with the resources necessary to gain that intelligence, those indicators and warning, but it is less optimal than when we were there physically. There's no other way to say it. I'm confident though that we're looking for and at the right things to gain that warning. Second question was, remind me, quick foreign actors. Foreign actors, yes. Um, again, no secret there that some of our great power competition adversaries um, seek to manipulate the information environment in such a way as to contribute to our political divide and to heighten or amp up some of those ongoing phenomena. I can't put a number on that 5%, 10%, 50% in terms of what that that um, amping up effect really is, but I think it's, it's indisputable. What I can't do, and I don't know the answer to, is whether that there's a direct line between those, those government efforts and individuals who ultimately take action and would qualify in a sense as a domestic terrorist, someone who engaged in an actual act of violence. I suspect though, we'll, when, if and when that happens, we'll find <coughs> out forensically and retrospectively, not beforehand. And then lastly, the question about the southwest border. Um, as you know, we're kind of we're in the midst of a massive migration surge that is global and hemispheric, not simply at the southern border. And certainly a, a spillover effect of that mass migration globally is that the volume of individuals encountered at the southern border trying to cross into the United States for whatever purpose, it's just way, way up. And so it stands to reason that more of those that we encounter at the southern border have, might have some or another tangential connection or less tangential connection to terrorism in their background, something that might have been um, caused them to be put into our Thai database, for example. And that is something that we at DHS are trying to to increase our capacity to plan for, respond to, and resource towards. Um, but it's a challenge. As you know, with everything at the southwest border right now, it's resources, resources, resources. Um, and I guess what I can also say, though, what we have not seen is any information that suggests that foreign terrorist organizations, groups, are actively using or trying to use a perceived vulnerability in this area to contribute to their operations. I don't know that I'm aware of anything we've seen in that regard. That doesn't mean, though, that we don't need to be concerned about and working hard to address the way in which terrorists or 
people with terrorism links might exploit um, vulnerabilities at the southern border. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question. It's going to be mine. <laughs> uh, you know, it's cliche to ask you what what keeps you up at night, and, and, and having been you know, three decades in government, I think you probably, I hope you sleep relatively well. You've seen it all, uh, which raises the question of what are we not seeing? What what do you see on the horizon that we we haven't prioritized when it comes to the threat landscape, the policy ramifications, and things like that? This is uh, where I work. Where I worry about failure of imagination. Um, or my own imagination, is terrorist use of modern technologies. Um, it was a truism for, for much of the post 9-11 period that we, had a, we held a huge technological edge over our terrorism adversaries. I worry that that may no longer be true with individuals who have access to um, modern technology in a way that would enable them to avoid detection by, the, by our authorities or enable them to carry out um, attacks of significant consequence despite their relative weakness as measured in conventional terms. And so again, I worry about what I don't, I, what, I worry about what I can't imagine in terms of how modern technologies might be used by uh, um, violent extremists against us. At the same time, we're trying, we're opportunity driven. We want to use those same technologies to make our counterterrorism work less labor intensive, less person power intensive, and more driven by analytics and, and technology. It's cheaper, it's more effective, and it's more sustainable and reliable in the long run to do it that way. So I don't want to paint the technology picture as being entirely grim and gloomy. It can work to our advantage as well. But it creates an, asymm an asymmetry that I don't think we felt for most of the post nine eleven period. I'm hoping we see like a chat GPT intel report at some point in the near future. Um, a lot of guys in Langley very worried about that. Um, on behalf of the program on extremism and insight, my colleague Aaron and also insight director Gina Lee, I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Nick for his um, structure and and. and even keel, but also important remarks uh, on these things. You could all welcome me and join me in taking that.